Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our NACE Calgary webinar series. I'm your host, Brett Johnson, Program Chair for NACE Calgary. So here at NACE Calgary, we're extremely proud of our webinar series. And with that, I am pleased to announce we've now hit 100 subscribers to our YouTube channel. Yay! So only about 900 more to go, and then we can start making money and maybe afford some better celebration graphics. So today's webinar features Anna Benz from Iris NDT. Anna has been with Iris NDT for over 23 years and is currently the chief engineer. Her specialties include corrosion, failure, and infection. She's worked extensively for the chemical processing industry, petrochemical plants, fertilizer plants, oil and gas, and nickel refineries around the world. She graduated as a materials engineer at the University of Simon Bolivar in Venezuela and obtained a master's degree in materials engineering at the University of British Columbia. She had several CGSB NDT certificates and CWB level three and API 510 certifications. Anna, we are super excited to have you come join us today on our channel. Thanks for joining us, Anna. So what are you going to talk to us about today? Well, thank you very much for such a nice introduction, Brett. I want to talk to you about some of the little bit of savvy that I have picked up over the years working with tanks. And I have a few cases that I'm hoping catch your interest. With that, before we jump in that, I'm just going to briefly talk about our annual sponsors. Their continued contributions allow us to be able to provide this webinar series to our membership at no charge. So today I'd like to highlight one of our gold sponsors, Rise School Corrosion Services. So Rise School Corrosion has been a longtime supporter of NACE Calgary and NACE International. All their technical staff has, have either NACE certifications or are diligently working towards necessary achievements in order to satisfy these certifications. They believe NACE education, along with applicable experience, is a cornerstone of their organization. RISCO's success is built on the five pillars of service, integrity, innovation, knowledge, and excellence. RISCO Corrosion offers a complete set of services and equipment for all our corrosion monitoring needs. And of course, to all our other annual sponsors are a huge reason why we can do what we do. Our sponsors help fund several initiatives that NACE Calgary takes on to promote the knowledge of corrosion, sustainability, and asset integrity to our industry and the next generation of engineers. To each one of our sponsors, thank you so much for your continued support. So to see this recording and um, of our other past webinars, be sure to check out our website at uh, nacecalgary.ca. And there you can find a list of all our other past sessions uh, and uh, our YouTube channel link. So Anna is gonna give her presentation live. Um, so be sure to stick around our presentation after the presentation as we'll move into a live Q&A session. Please submit your questions to Anna in your Zoom client by clicking on the Q&A button. And if you're joining us from YouTube Live, please enter your questions into the comments there and I'll also be sure to ask them. So Anna, I turn it over to you at this point. Thank you very much, Brett. And uh, I, I can't tell you how happy I am to participate in this NACE uh, project. I have long admired the work that NACE Calgary does for our community. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. So with that, um, let me start sharing with you some of these uh, tank stories. There. All right, so uh, tanks are everywhere in our industrial societies. We, we, because we see them everywhere, we tend not to realize how fundamental they are. And the fact is that there's a lot of savvy that goes into running, making, and keeping tanks operating safely. Nevertheless, when tanks fail, you know that it's a big issue. And some of the tank failures that are well known by the public are the distilling tank with molasses failure that happened in Massachusetts uh, over a century ago, killed 21 people. And anybody who studies fracture mechanics is usually subjected to the knowledge of the importance of that tank failure and the importance of fracture mechanics. Then there's the terrible Bhopal tragedy in 1984, where more than 3,800 people died. Uh, and it changed forever our approach to chemical uh, sites. Then there's the sulfuric acid storage tank failure in 2001 in Delaware. 
and uh, one person died and eight others were injured. However, it was a truly tragic uh, experience for everybody, including all the aquatic life. It's a very important failure. So the ones I'm gonna talk to you about are not as impacting, but hopefully there will be a couple of lessons there that might be useful. So I'm first going to be talking about uh, shell to roof weld failure. Then I'm going to be talking about how to weld the drain nozzles. Then about sulfuric acid tanks and the list goes on as is shown here. So let's get going. Okay, uh, one of the very first important tank failures I worked on was that of a fixed roof tank that exploded while personnel were refurbishing equipment upstream of the tank. The roof was torn off and one of the persons working upstream was severely injured. When I started calculating this, I ended up with an estimate of 0.6 pounds. That's not a lot. And it took me a long time to understand that indeed that is all that it takes to make the tank roof fail. What had happened was that because of the work that they were doing upstream, there was a pressure surge. Because there was a pressure surge, the vents were, uh, it, they were taken over their capacity. So they could not pass on the liquids from, uh, from that tank to the smaller tank on time. And that's how the tank roof got pressurized. Had the vent been larger or had, had, um, had, had the vent been larger, then this wouldn't have happened. But those are some of the learnings that we do along the way. So why do they make these uh, uh, tank roofs so weak? It's intentional. The reason behind it is that when you have these pressurizations, then the tank doesn't go into liftoff. Uh, and it's much better to just have the roof torn off than to have a rocket. There are other problems with the tank roofs, and this uh, these are the uh, these are two images that were uh, very luckily uh, provided to me by one of our uh, senior inspectors, who's not with the company anymore. But this work is uh, to me really important. And what he noticed is that when they remove the insulation on a tank roof, look at all the holes. See all these holes around every one of the nozzles. You couldn't see that until the insulation was removed, but it's pretty spooky. So there is a lesson in all of this, and the lesson is kind of simple. Don't walk on the roof unless you have a really good mitigation plan and have some other things that you can do to prevent something very bad happening, but they're not really meant as structural parts. Okay, so let's go on to our second uh, story. And this one is really important uh, too. I'm going to be showing you some uh, microscopic sections. Don't let your eyes get glazy. No, no. It's quite interesting. Uh, and uh, so, so be patient with me. I'll do my best to go through them so that they don't get nitpicky. Okay, so what I'm showing you on the top here is what was inside the tank and on the bottom, what was outside the tank. And there was a repat for this uh, drain nozzle. And this large tank had been fabricated to carry diesel and they had filled it and it kind of got empty. Um, this is another view of what we get out of the tank failure. So what I'm showing you here on the left is a cross section uh, of that nozzle. So here on the, uh, uh, I'm showing you the inside, here I'm showing you the repad, and then here's the outside of that nozzle. Now, if you take a close look at this weld, it doesn't look that good. So what we did was here on the right, we have across the same cross section, but we are now doing color contrast magnetic particle. And you can see the crack going all the way there. But take a closer look and you'll see that this outside repad weld doesn't have a crack. 
So how did it leak? Well, uh, here's another close up of the inside weld with a large, large, nice crack. And uh, here's the deposited weld metal. And here is a close up of what it looks like, not at seven o'clock, but at two o'clock, the repad had the crack. And this is a very common problem when you're looking for leaks. They never go in a straight line. If you ever get a nice straight leak from inside to outside, let me know, because I've been looking for one for a long time and haven't found it. Uh, when we looked at this with a microscope, yep, here's that metallographic cross section. We saw porosity. We saw that there wasn't fusion between some of the passes. And finally, we saw also that there were shrinkage cracks on the weld. When I see this, I'm used to working with people with pretty high standards who care about what they do. So I asked uh, oh, a friend who's a welder uh, who happens to also weld tank, uh, tanks for a living. And I said, hey, what happened here? You know, was the crew just didn't care what was going on? And he explained to me something that made a lot of sense. He told me, Anna, tanks are welded from the bottom up, so from the floor. So when you are welding all of these drains, you have to be on your belly. And you can barely see what you're doing around that drain on the very bottom of the tank. And for some of us, that belly can put quite some spacing. So this is not an easy thing to do. And finally, I understood. I said, okay, so if that's the case, then how am I going to prevent one of these uh, tanks from leaking from the string. And he said, what I do is that I stagger the welding passes so that there is no overlap in the cracking or in the porosity between one pass and the other. And after all that conversation and these cross sections, what I learned was that if I have a critical tank, I'm going to let the hydrostatic test sit for longer than the minimal couple of hours that it is mandatory to wait because those tiny leaks take a little while to finally finish developing. As well, if it is such a critical weld, I would be measuring the throat sizes as best as I can. Because if you look closely at those images I showed you, you're gonna see that the throat sizes weren't that much. Finally, I would say that if it's a really critical tank, I would throw in some fluorescent liquid penetrant and that's part of how I would be doing my hydrostatic test to see, because it's much easier to see something fluorescent perhaps than to see a drop of water. Okay, so let's go on to the next one. And that's sulfuric acid tanks. And they require internal inspections and I'm gonna show you why. Um, and you're gonna say, why are you talking to us about uh, sulfuric acid tanks? People don't have those things. Well, you'd be surprised. Almost every industrial site where I have been has some sort of storage for sulfuric acid because we use it for controlling the pH of the water that we use for controlling temperature all over our uh, processing equipment. It is truly uh, the largest volume chemical that we use industrially. It's very important. So take a look around to see what tanks or what reservoirs you have a sulfuric acid in the sites that you work, because they're very common. Fortunately for us, NACE SP0294 uh, is superb, and they give you practices as to how these tanks must be fabricated. And not only that, but they tell you how, uh, what sort of a frequency periods there should be for inspecting the tanks. This uh, practice was developed with a great deal of wisdom. So believe me, if you have anything to do with sulfuric acid tanks, take a good look because it's very well done. Okay, so they tell you that you have, to, uh, you have to be cautious about having localized damage. And you say, well, what's going on? You know, so 95% or more sulfuric acid. In reality, yeah, it's the steel corrodes, but so long as you don't disturb the uh, layer of corroded steel, 
nothing happens. So what's the worry? Well, the problem is we do disturb that because we end up with areas of turbulence unwittingly, and it's not difficult to do. Uh, then the other problem is that invariably you get a little bit of water getting into your sulfuric acid. And 95% sulfuric acid generates that gooey, very nice protective uh, layer of corrosion, but diluted sulfuric acid definitely does not. It just tears away with the steel very quickly, very, very high rates. So fortunately for us today, we do have also radiography that we can use for the smaller nozzles. But outside of that, and it's still mandatory to go and take an internal look at your tanks, at your sulfuric acid tanks. So let me show you why. Now, what I'm showing you here on the left is uh, a manhole. And all of these nice little grooves that you have here are done by the hydrogen that is coming out of the corrosive reaction. And at 12 o'clock, this is a typical problem in uh, sulfuric acid tanks. So what many people do is that they put in a sleeve of a higher alloy and that works. But I still would say you have to be aware of this because even though you have sleeves, I'm always afraid of where the sleeve ends. Then what I'm showing you here on the right is uh, something that we found at the site. Uh, on the outside, you could see something had been leaking because of all this black product. But in those days, the only thing we had to try to find out where the leak was, were some um, ultrasonics. And when you have such a small uh, nozzle, your probe can rock. It's not easy to find that. And when you go and look on the inside at 12 o'clock, it's very sneaky. It's only this line. So that's why it is so challenging to find. On the other hand, with today's uh, computed radiography, digital detector array, we have various techniques that are extremely effective. You get to see these itty bitty little bits of localized losses really well, but that doesn't take care of your 20 inch manhole and in other places, the ring at the top of the tank where water can get in. What I'm showing you here on the left is you can do this type of radiography on insulated equipment. So what's the lesson that I'm hoping you remember here is that concentrated sulfuric acid tanks require internal inspections. And if you have any doubts about what I'm, about what I'm telling you, take a look with Mother Google uh, into the Delaware 2001 sulfuric acid incident. What had happened is that they had continued delaying and delaying the internal inspections prior to the accident happening. Okay, corrosion under insulation. I believe in corrosion under insulation and the prairies. I didn't uh, until I started finding out all these problems that happened to us. And while we have very dry land in Canada and away from the sea, uh, you, we still have cooling towers that have drifts that go and uh, the first nice and cool surface that they find is some insulated equipment and that water precipitates and can get inside the insulation. And the insulation cladding is not meant to be completely uh, unobtrusive or sorry, completely imp impenetrable. So yeah, our insulation gets wet up here in the north and in the south everywhere. Um, as well, we have the snow, uh, the, the mist from the melting snow and the first nice cold surface that it meets is the cladding on tanks or the cladding on piping. So yes, CUI happens in our weathers and I'll give you examples of what happens. Um, one of the techniques we have for looking for it without completely demolishing the insulation is called pulse steady current in tanks. And it has uh, some advantages and it has some limitations. Uh, the advantage is you don't have to remove insulation. It has many other advantages. One of the concerns though, is that always people want to know what the remaining thickness is. Well, sorry, that's not the information that it gives you. What it gives you as well, this area looks like it has more losses than this area. And the problem is that the equipment might not be able, uh, might easily detect 
uh, shallow losses in a large area and not so well for localized losses that go through thickness, but that have a very small footprint. So um, on the other hand, when it works, it works beautifully. And this is an example of it. Uh, one of our inspectors had been asked to go and check underneath these uh, ladder rungs uh, because people noticed that the steel didn't look in that good of a shape uh, underneath the rungs. This was not insulated, but it had quite a bit of corrosion product on it. Well, initially our uh, very savvy technician started scraping away and polishing away so that he could get a nice flat reading to do his um, ultrasonic thickness. In the process, liquid started coming out at him. And so our uh, customer said, you're not picking any more on my tanks. And I have another sister of this one that I need to know on what type of shape it is. As a consequence, we use pulsated current and take a look at what a nice, uh, what a nice idea it gives you of where your worst corrosion is. I am noticing, Brett, that we have four questions. Do I try to answer those now or later? No, we'll answer them during the live Q&A session afterwards. So just run okay. through the rest of your presentation. All right. So here's another example of CUI uh, on our uh, tanks here up north. And this was uh, a tank that had polyurethane foam insulation and the losses were greater and here on the bottom side, and that's underneath the insulation ring. I showed these images in Galveston in the US, and I was told by several inspectors that that was exactly what they encountered in, in their local site. So if you have polyurethane foam insulation, you have to be aware that underneath the rings, you may have some surprises after a few years. And then of course, I have to remind you of what happens in the tank roofs that you get so many, uh, you, you can get even complete through thickness breaches uh, on the roof. And these tend to happen next to where you have pooling uh, in structural parts. Well, pulse steady current, unfortunately cannot help you there because it has to be on a flat area away from where you have those uh, changes in geometry. So the moral of the story is that, yep, we develop CUI even in our dry lands. Okay, this is a really important lesson. I know that because I run into this several times. Uh, when you have equipment that has been in corrosive amine service, your cleaning has to be spectacular for you not to develop problems. So what am I showing you on the left? Here's a tank bottom and here's some of the pitting. And this is our metallographic cross section in the lab. When we take a closer look with a microscope underneath that layer on the uh, inside of the tank, these pits are full of stuff. And if you don't somehow get rid of that stuff inside those pits, you end up with cracks. And I'll give you an example. I have tried to put some footwork here to show that I know what I'm talking about and to prove something that I couldn't prove. So I'm just telling you that it's my speculation that what happens is that when you have those remnants from amine, you end up when you're welding with uh, the higher temperatures, you end up with caustic stress cracking similar to the one that we get on plant sites during operating conditions. And there are two really good practices uh, one of them is the NACE RP4036 for avoiding caustic stress corrosion cracking. And there's also the practice for, um, for API 5715 about the damage that affects our industrial equipment. On, uh, on the NACE practice, where they tell you for welding repairs, they tell you the surfaces to be welded, including adjacent surfaces should be free of oxide and caustic contamination. Caustic compounds can result in well defects and cracking. In fact, they're being very um, subtle there 
because if you go to any of the people who are used to doing repairs on some of this equipment, what they have is a, at least a three-step uh, cleaning process. And by that, I mean, they, they use chemicals, they use, uh, they clean off those chemicals, they neutralize, they have quite a few steps to make this happen without having cracks blooming. And the cracks blooming that I'm talking about look like this, except I'm only showing you one of the cracks here. And there are intergranular cracks that grow through the equipment. So not only do you have a surface problem now, but you may have some penetration through the thickness because of the welding repair you have just done. So aiming services require absolutely spotless cleaning. And by that, it requires multiple steps. Here are other uh, problems with tank force when you're welding them. You can see that our customer had tried to do a coating repair here. I'm showing you the process side of the tank bottom, but there are some metal, bare metal parts and these lab joints are typically indicative of a repair that was being done on this. When we took a look at this on the soil side in the lab, you can see crack magnetic particle indications on the soil side. So what did we see? Well, here is the cross section and this bottom side is the soil side. Look at all the pitting and look there, are, this is a crack, there's a close up of the crack. And you're gonna say, what happened? Well, I think what happened was that when they put this lap joint here, they ended up with some, uh, they already had had some leaks going to the soil side and with those corrosion losses, they ended up with further uh, pitting and also some cracking on the soil side. Um, what happens underneath uh, all that coating? Why didn't it stay on? If you look with a microscope underneath that coating, here, what I'm showing you on the top are the coating layers. But then underneath here, this is all corrosion product. So when they coated, they had some of that corrosion product and coatings, coatings do a pretty decent job, but it's very difficult to adhere to corrosion scale that crumbles off. So I just wanna give you more fear here by showing you some of the cracks that we saw and by showing you that those cracks are intergranular, which is typical of these services. Uh, and I tried very hard to explain to here my, uh, to you why I think this is a process of uh, environmental stress cracking, but I'm gonna stay away from that right now. If you wanna quiz me on this, do that a little later. So the story here is that tank repairs are challenging. I have another couple of very interesting pictures of what happens in the, in the floor. Take a look at this. That's your tank bottom and that's your tank wall. And notice that the soil isn't there. So that poor joint here has to be uh, working under some tremendous stress. And what we found was that it was cracked and it ended up being cut in multiple strips because we wanted to identify exactly where the crack started and where it ended toward the inside. Um, and uh, the message from me to you here is that a tank bottom shell well needs, a bank, tank bottom to shell well is critical and it requires non-destructive examination. This is a fun story, okay? Now, as the working on, on failures for so many years, I got the true joy of working on this fiber reinforced plastic septic tank. Fortunately for me, it had never been in service. What had happened was that you can see the tank here and it's below ground. Uh, when they were installing the tank, all of a sudden there was a major rain surge and personnel had to run away. And when they came back, the tanks were kind of tethered to the ground, but not entirely. So they were kind of floating boats and they had areas that had been strapped. Consequently, they had point boats on them. As a consequence, when, we, when I went inside the tank, uh, here are the separated areas from, um, from some of the levels inside the tank they had separated from the shell. 
And if you look closely at any of the nozzles, you could see a lot of whitening. And that's typical in uh, non-metallics, uh, polymers, I mean plastics. When, when they become damaged, they can develop these white layers. Um, I learned a lot during this job. One of the things that I learned was that thou shall not uh, use just any soil when you are burying these uh, septic tanks. Uh, and what we saw were chunks of ice. If you put that chunk of ice, of course, it's our Canadian spring. If you put that chunk of ice against uh, a fiberglass vessel, you're going to, going to end up with a point load and fiberglass does not like point loads. So yes, you could see whitening on the tank shell where this had been in touch. I learned so much during this job. The, the day when I thought we had figured it out, you know, it was just a problem that had happened because of that torrential phone, uh, rainfall. Um, no problem. But then uh, while I'm standing there thinking I'm leaving and I'm looking underneath the high level where, where I'm standing, about three feet, one meter below me, I see this gush of water coming out. And I didn't know what that gush of water was. And I asked the people that I was working with, where did that come from? And they said, oh, that's an underground stream. Sometimes it comes, but most times it's not. But, you know, today it's coming out. Well, guess what? That stream was coming and hitting the tank that the, the tanks that were being buried. No problem for the fiberglass to handle this. However, if you erode all the soil around it, you've got a problem because that tank does not, not have support anymore. So if you get involved with buried tanks, it's a very interesting field. And please, please, please pay attention to everything that the people who make these tanks tell you about the practices of the soils that you must use. They are absolutely right. Those practices are essential if you don't wanna end up replacing the tanks very quickly. Okay, so, so far I have talked to you mainly about destructive and intrusive inspections of tanks, but there are some non-intrusive non inspections. One of them is acoustic emission of ammonia tanks. And I do know of companies that have kept their tanks closed for more than 20 years because they have constantly monitored not constantly, periodically monitored with acoustic emission, and they have not had mishaps. Um, the problem with ammonia tanks is that the moment you open them, you expose it to oxygen, and that's when you get the stress cracking. So if you don't open it, you don't get that cracking. Then on the other hand, if you've never investigated what the inside surface condition is of that tank, you'd be afraid of doing that. However, as I said, some companies have done a very thorough job at keeping tr track of their ammonia tanks with acoustic emission with very good results. And then there's the future. And uh, these are all the robotics that you are going to see uh, that allow us to go into tanks uh, without having to empty the tanks. And to date, they're Inspections are limited. They're mainly done for tanks containing water, but the world is changing and I envy you for what you might see regarding robotics in the future. And that takes me to the end of my stories. Uh, I have to say thank you to quite a few people, especially uh, my colleagues in the company who have provided these images. They're listed here. Uh, I. I owe what I know to them. I'm also extraordinarily thankful to uh, the Iris NDT customers who allow me to share these images so that we all learn from uh, people's mishaps. To me, that's extremely valuable. And with that, Brett, that's my last slide. Awesome. Well, thanks, Anna. We really appreciate you uh, providing the well, quite a unique uh, perspective there about um, tanks and how they fail and some good industry experiences that we can then share with everybody uh, on that. So with that, um, as you kind of alluded, we've already got a pretty live uh, Q&A 
session going. So if you also have a question here for Anna, um, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to ask a question or enter it in the chat on YouTube Live and I'll be sure to ask it. So, um, so first of all here, so, you know, you, you talked a bit about um, uh, hydro testing a tank. So curious, uh, if we uh, are installing uh, our internal liner into the tank, is it okay to run the hydro test after the internal liner uh, is installed? Is there potentially any impact uh, on the liner itself from the hydro test or any potential concerns that would happen uh, with that hydro test? I'd be more concerned about the fact that once you cover up a leak, the leak might not show up until after you've done your, the test uh, because polymers are um, viscoelastic and they are really good at short term, uh, at a short term show of their properties and they can cover a little gap for a while. So I'd be concerned about how effective your hydrostatic test would be. Uh, again, if it's a really critical uh, vessel, I'd probably do it before and after. Fair enough. It's good to know. Um, also thinking, what about external coatings? Same kind of question. Any concerns about before or after or any, if you do a hydrostatic test, is there any impact on that uh, external coating? Sorry, I don't have experience with that, so I cannot answer. No, fair enough. Thanks for the insight. Um, <clears throat> so what, back to one of the slides there. Um, when you were... Um, I think it was during the the slides where that you were talking about the hydrostatic uh, test and the crack um, that went in it. Do you know approximately when um, when did that uh, repad there end up cracking? Did was it did it happen like while it was in service or did it happen while it was testing? Um, do you know if there was because of the hydrostatic test that caused it and um, was uh, NDT done during the time or done afterwards to help solve this problem? Okay. Uh, I think that those cracks developed as the, as the nozzle was being uh, welded. And it has to do with the difficulty of being on your belly, trying to see something that you can't see that is at floor level. Uh, so it's, as you know, if, if, you, if you can't see what you're doing, it's difficult to, to know what you're doing. So no, I think First of all, one of those cracks was a hydrogen crack. So that is typical of fabrication. Um, and as far as how quickly the crack formed, I think a good chunk of that crack was there from the very beginning. But I think once you start filling things up, your stresses rearrange themselves, especially for the bottom. So you might not have seen the crack from the very beginning. Um, also, you can do NDT on this, but you have the same belly problem there that you have to try to get underneath that drain nozzle. So I'm not against doing NDT, okay? I'm an NDT practitioner. I firmly believe in NDT. But in that instance, I think that the practical advice of my welder friend of staggering the passes is very good. I also think that measuring the weld throat is a good idea. You just have to get a skinny guy to do it. <laughs> oh man, I, that is not something I envy of those guys. Uh who go out and do that and do that job on that. Mm -hmm. uh, well, thanks for that insight there. Um, so related to, for example, um, the, ex the example you had uh, with uh, corrosion under insulation. Um, so is it in your experience that owners uh, with uh, the um, above grade um, atmosphere coatings on the piping, um, not necessarily this as well as thought. Is it your recommendation that the coating under insulation should be an immersion coating like uh, an FEB or an epoxy to protect against the corrosion from such insulation or what kind of coating would you expect should be used under that insulation? I am so sorry I'm not a coating specialist. I should have my friend Linda Gray with me and she'd be going, oh Anna, how can you not know that? But I don't know that. I might say something very foolish if I answer. I'm very sorry. That's no, I, do no. believe, I do honestly trust and listen to quite a bit of what the coding specialists are uh, that I have worked with. I think they have a wealth of knowledge. So trust, trust the people who have worked on this for years. I, I think they know a couple of things. Yeah, no, totally fair. You don't want to talk something you're not an expert in. 
Um, so can you, can you use thermographic methods to inspect insulated tanks to find certain problem areas? Yeah, they're used quite often. Um, it, it's not a bad thing. The problem is that you, you, you can uh, identify when you have wet insulation, for example, but and, and wet insulation is one of the precursors to get CUI. However, if when you're inspect, inspecting it, the uh, insulation isn't wet, you're not gonna know. So it, it's good and it's a good monitoring technique, but it has its limitations is what I'm saying. No, totally. Uh, yeah, well, that's fair. Thanks for that. Um, so also related to corrosion under insulation, which I think is a pretty uh, key topic to our, our demographic here. So um, so with the tanks, um, did they, um, do they not have a submersive service appropriate coating under the insulation? Like the, in that example there, um, I guess it's it's interesting with that potentially why it didn't have a coating type of fail. Maybe this is related to the coating as you can't answer, but it's also mostly focused on that uh, key example you gave. Okay, I, I'm going to commit suicide in front of the very uh, pipeline savvy people who truly depend and rightfully so, on, on, uh, on, on um, coatings. I'm sorry, don't, don't kill me. But I come from the chemical process industry. If you have a nice wet environment that is cooking, at some point the coating is gonna fail. Okay, I'm sorry guys, but I'm telling you what I have seen. So in tank environments, if you have constantly water getting in, drying out, water getting in and drying out, you may end up, you, you are gonna have to be either replacing that coating every once in a while or something like that, but you can't depend on it, on equipment like we do for 10, 20, 25 years. All right, so now you can shoot me. Um, I'll let our audience be the judge of that, but uh, it's a, as, as a non-tank expert, it sounded pretty straightforward and good to me. But um, so anyways, so uh, related to um, DDA, do you know if there's any uh, limitations uh, with using DDA for, uh, for piping or a large diameter um, PCB, PEC um, uh, piping or tanks? Okay, DDA, that's Digital Detector Array Radiography. We use now, uh, we do corrosion surveys with DDA for piping of uh, less than eight inch diameter. The, result, the results are unbelievable. And uh, I, in my mind, they compete very well. If not, they're ahead of competing with uh, ultrasonic corrosion surveys. So, but that is the limitation. More than that, you start, uh, I think uh, ultrasonics has the edge because you don't have, to, um, unfortunately you have to remove insulation. See, that's the other beauty of doing DDA. You don't have to get rid of the insulation. You can, you can radiograph with all that insulation there. But for eight inches and higher, you start really uh, getting into challenges with the uh, digital detector array. You can do it, but it's not as wonderful as, as it is for less than that. Uh, you're talking about pulse steady current. Pulse steady current, I think, is a good pre-screening test. And after you do your pre-screening, you have to follow up with some detailed non-destructive testing. And if you have any cases where you have pinholes, that you have the possibility of having pinhole corrosion due to ID conditions or something like that, you have to be very cautious about how you use pulse steady current. How easy is it to do pulse steady current on your on your assets? Um, well, it, it, it's not supposed to be that difficult, but you have to be away from uh, changes in geometry. So, what I'm trying to say is I know it's good, but you have to be cautious, okay? So um, 
it, it, uh, the problem with the electromagnetic techniques is that they, uh, they give you a volumetric answer. So say your probe is of this size, it's going to average the losses underneath that. But it's going to show you an average that could be greater for something that is spread over a distance but shallow. Whereas you corrosion savvy people are saying, well, I'm more interested in, you know, what's the has a smaller opening, but that is deeper. And no, that's not the way that technique works. It gives you a variation in electromagnetic signals, not in thickness. Awesome. No, thanks for that clarification. So I'm curious, you know, you talked- The presentation is about tank, not about uh, CUI. By the way, I do have a CUI one where you can see a lot of damage from CUI, but anyway, that's another day. Okay. <clears throat> You had this. You had the slide in the case study on it, so <laughs> okay. I guess it's what sparks the good questions, right? Um, so the one. So I'm curious. The one uh, you, incident that you talked about with the berry tank on there. You talked a lot about um, the soil around the pipe. So curious. You know, how often is the soil pipe and considered uh, when you know installing below ground tanks? Is it is it common that all those kind of um, uh, best practices and recommendations are put in place, or does it happen to be pretty rare? Like, is this a big problem that people need to uh, consider with the soil around that's going to erode over time? Or with rare? fiberglass, with fiberglass, that was about fiberglass. I think steel yeah. would be more forgiving under those uh, cir circumstances. Fiberglass will not be that forgiving under those circumstances right. because you have rocks in the ground. A rock does nothing unless, uh, you know, if it's just sitting there, yeah, it's gonna cost you at some point some pitting. Uh, and if it's rocking, you know, it could be sooner rather than later. But, um, but with fiberglass, you end up with a crack. So for fiberglass, all of those practices that, by the way, the suppliers of these tanks give you the practices. They show you very nice images of how to do it, how high, this level of peat has to be and all of these things, they are all truthful. Fiberglass does not like point loads. And it, it would definitely not like having the soil underneath it uh, removed because it's got, it would then still be having some point loads from uh, anchors on it. And while it would be trying to float like a boat. So pay attention. <laughs> <clears throat> No, makes sense. I'm just curious how often that uh, is maybe that whole part is missed when trying to install fiberglass uh, tanks. If it's always something considered and well done, or if it's something that uh, is uh, a problem that always needs to be kind of uh, inspected and such to make sure that the soil around the fiberglass installation is staying intact and uh, strong and not having like you said, rocks or any washout or anything around it. I think that when we cover up things, we don't know what's going on. So, but in this case, you know, <laughs> the people who were there saw the water coming into the tank as they were installing it. So they were quite aware of what had happened. And they, as many people are in our industry, we are dedicated to this because we want to protect what we're doing and we do care about what we do to the environment, all of us. Awesome. So the um, so next question is related to um, MFE floor scanners. So are they able to detect you know, soil side corrosion on the tanks, um, even if there is, say, for example, an internal coating on the tank? I believe they are, yeah, because it's an electromagnetic technique. Uh, any limitations or concerns with that? You know, I have never read, uh, had, usually I learn about things when something fails, right? And I have not had major complaints about uh, the techniques for tank floors. The complaints I have heard, and it's again understandable, uh, has been because sometimes you get pitting and pitting is not as easy to detect as say more generalized losses. That's the only complaint I have had, but I think the industry got used to that. So I hear of things when it's really bad news. Fair enough. That's a good segue into the next question here. So I, I'm, 
Have you ever had any experience with, say, um, failures with either uh, stainless steel tanks or nickel-based uh, alloys, or anything related to just um, you know using uh, higher grade alloys out there? Oh, I I work on all of the uh, uh, stainless alloys all the time, uh, but most people have I, I have not worked on oh no that's not true yes I have worked on stainless uh, tanks uh, and and the problem that I found was that they had erosion but also because it was an austenitic stainless steel it was extremely forgiving so people figured out how to how to repair it and when things are forgiving and you can repair them easily nobody complains you know just the first couple of times you go and see to make sure that everything's okay so yeah, I have worked on austenitic stainless steel tanks. Don't ask me about the duplex. I have not worked on that one yet. And no, that's not true either. I have worked on a duplex one and the welding was a problem. Yeah, sorry, but that's another day, okay? <laughs> <laughs> no really interesting stories uh, to tell about big failures on them, the small well, little Well, I just have a, a personal story that I thought was really, really funny. I went and I saw what they were doing. And really what happened is with duplex stainless, you have to pay attention to your welding, okay? So when, when I heard they had problems, I was checking this out. I'm starting to ask questions about, okay, so what were the consumables you used? You know, give me, well, it turned out that they had been using various types of consumables because this one had more nickel, right? So obviously it should be better because it cost more. That's not exactly the case. They ended up with a lot of uh, a lot of cracks, and fortunately, we could go underneath the tank, so we could see where the leaks were coming out. And so, what we did was develop sleeves underneath where the the leaks were, and mm -hmm. I called it putting some diapers on the tank. And next thing I know, <laughs> next thing I know, I see the guys heading up there, and everybody's asking them, "Okay, so." what are you doing? They said, well, we're putting diapers on the, on the tank. And I thought, okay, we're good. We're on the same page. <laughs> yeah, that, that sounds like a very nice technical term that isn't going to, you know, cause any confusion. <laughs> no, good story. Thanks for sharing that. Um, <clears throat> so we only have time here for uh, about two or three more questions here. I know there's um, as it seems to be, the questions keep rolling in faster than we can answer them. So thanks everybody for your big interest on that. So um, are, they, are there any NDT techniques used to inspect FRP tanks, uh, such as thickness measurement tools, or uh, I don't know, any other kind of ideas? Yes, but, but you have to be very uh, savvy about it. By the way, this is very opinionated, okay? So yes, you're gonna hear me being very opinionated. Hey, that's emission. what we want. <laughs> Acoustic emission is unbelievably perfect for testing mm -hmm. fiberglass tanks. Not good, perfect. Uh, especially after they have been in service. I have tested hydrochloric acid tanks in service and I have figured out where the crack is. It sounded like uh, crispy crunch. Uh, <laughs> when you were standing by the tank. Fortunately, we had the acoustic emission equipment. I started going crazy way before the tank, uh, before our ears told us what was happening. But anyway, yes, I believe in acoustic emission for fiberglass tanks. However, uh, acoustic emission has a high price tag, so most people are shy about it. Uh, and uh, if, if you know what you're doing, you can do uh, ultrasonics but you have to keep really good track of how you're calibrating and what you're calibrating. You can do it, but it's not easy, okay? That's cool. I, I don't know how, that, that's a good, that's great to hear. It's such a good uh, inspection tool that people could be able to use to, to determine the integrity of the fiberglass tanks. Um, I don't think that's controversial at all, but uh, coming from somebody who's well experted in that, um, so maybe just out of curiosity, what in your a kind of opinion um, do you believe might be kind of uh, like how bad, bad do you think uh, bottom, bottom of tank corrosion rates might um, accelerate if 
for example, if you don't have uh, a CP program um, working on the bottom of the tanks. Um, say, for example, if it wasn't installed correctly or it maybe wasn't turned on uh, properly and it was only found out maybe years afterwards, you know, how bad do you think things could get and what should a, an operator do uh, to ensure the integrity of their tank? I think the cathodic protection people have a very good and very interesting and extremely valuable function in our society. So yes, I, I believe in cathodic protection, I do. And uh, especially um, people have to know what they're doing because if you end up with uh, the cathodic protection system having water <laughs> and, and not being effective, yes, I, I know that you can see the, I have tested uh, tanks for which the cathodic protection system had failed. So I, I'm a believer. Uh, fair enough. Um, so maybe here, uh, one last question here uh, for you. So back to your favorite topic of corrosion under insulation uh, on here. So have you at all um, considered um, dew point as a potential source of moisture ingress into, you know, under the insulation there to cause corrosion under insulation? Yep. Yes, it's true. Yes, it's true. It should be. Uh, it's yeah. In the South, they call it uh, that the pipe is sweating, which of course the pipe isn't gonna sweat. This is steel, but yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. But yeah, oh yeah, that's the problem. Absolutely. Yeah, pretty, uh, I guess, pretty strong correlation in that then. Yes, because of the drying out and the getting wet, right? So it's those cycles that keep you and me uh, employed because, uh, it's all those temperature variations and cyclic service uh, that result in, in more corrosion problems that we have to solve. Awesome. Well, that's great. Maybe I'll quiz you just here for one quick follow-up question related to the, uh, uh, the, the acoustic um, measurement tool. So um, there's an, an opinion here that um, the acoustic measurement doesn't exactly tell you where the crack um, or if there's a leak on the pipeline. Um, how would one determine that? Um, maybe you can provide some further clarification with that. I, I was talking about acoustic emission for fiberglass tanks. Uh, once you're talking about a pipeline, I don't know if it's practical because the attenuation is very high. So if we're talking about tanks, uh, what the acoustic emission does is tell you the area where you should go and do a visual. But if acoustic mission is telling you to go and take a look inside a fiberglass tank, you should. But I don't think that's what your, um, th that's what your member is asking you. I think they're asking me about pipelines and that's a different story. Fair enough, fair enough. I, I will admit I'm not an expert on that and interpreting as I can. So thanks for that clarification. So that will be our last question for today. Um, thank you so much, Anna, for everything that you've um, provided today. This was an absolutely um, great presentation and a great Q&A session. Thanks for answering all of our questions. It was a lively bunch again. I'm sorry if we didn't end up getting your questions. There was a couple other remaining ones uh, which were kind of uh, brought in there that I didn't have an opportunity to ask. So. Um, maybe Anna, can they reach out to you if they want some extra clarification with that? Absolutely, it would be my pleasure. Awesome, so with that, we're gonna close out here. And if you yourself are also uh, interested in, you know, sharing your research or experience or potentially an interesting case study with this industry on this platform, please email me at program at nacecalgary.ca and I'll work to kind of get you on our channel here. So, um, with that, thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, please be safe out there. Enjoy this nice warm Friday if you can. And, uh, and goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you.